Hey guys, it's Adam from Pixel, and welcome to part two of our analysis and commentary on the Senate hearing regarding AI um, uh, and copyright, essentially artists' rights with regards to copyright, and a massively important trial going on right now. Technically, this was recorded on the 12th of July. Uh, we're several days later after this. Um, that said, uh, before you watch this, go and watch the first part where I go through the entire open, all of the opening statements of all of the five people giving testimonies, including Ben Brooks, representing Stability AI, the company that produced Stable Diffusion, uh, uh, Dana Rao, representing Adobe and their implementation of AI with Adobe Fire, Firefly. Um, then we have Professor Matthew Sag representing the academic aspects of AI and artist rights in that regard. Miss Carla Ortiz, the beloved Carla Ortiz, representing the visual arts side of things. And then finally, uh, uh, Jeffrey Harleston representing the musical side of the artistic industry. So essentially at one end we have uh, the AI argument. In the middle we have the professor and over on the right side we have the two uh, individuals representing the artistic side of things. Go watch that first because it's very important to get a ba uh, to kind of get a baseline on, on what each individual's professional and personal focus is with regards to this argument because this is something that impacts every single one of us artists no matter which domain you're in. So let's continue exactly where we left off. Five minute round. Um, and I'm going to start by just exploring how we can respect existing uh, copyrighted works, copyright protections, while continuing uh, to safely develop and advance AI technologies. If we run, run out of time, we'll do a second round. My hunch is there's at least that much interest. Mr. Brooks, if I might just start with you. Um, generative AI models uh, like those your company creates are trained in no small part on vast quantities of copyrighted content, on data from copyrighted content. Do copyright owners know if their works have been used to train Stability's models? Is Stability paying rights holders for that use? Why not, if not? And how would doing so impact your business and your business model? Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, so to the first question, models like Stable Diffusion are trained on open data sets or curated subsets of those data sets. So right away. Start paying attention to how ambiguous, how, how ambiguous meaning, meaning not really sitting anywhere. It's not any, it's not clear. It kind of, it's this wishy-washy language. He uses a lot of this euphemistic, uh, um, ambiguous, wishy-washy language to skirt around truths. He could have just said yes or no, but he's going to start using all this, this, this tech jargon on you. Fusion, for example, takes a, uh, a, a, five billion image data set we filter that for content bias he's not answering the question he's going right into what it's filtered to do and he very simply went over oh millions and millions of data sets so to speak uh, and it scans for bias and blah 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 he's not answering the question he's asking have you contacted have you remunerated have you asked permission to the artists to you and me to use this stuff he's not answering the question Quality, um, and then we use a, a 2 billion image subset to train a model like Stable Diffusion. Because it's open, you can go to a website. You can type in the URL of an image. You can type in a name. You can see if that work has appeared in the training data set. Uh, and then we're working with partners to uh, take those opt-out requests and, as I say, to incorporate them into our own training and development process. He basically said, no, we, we take what we want. So we, we do think open data sets are important. They're one part of how... Now he's telling us that it's important to take without permission. ...are able to inspect AI for uh, fairness and bias and safety. As I mentioned in the last video, fairness, bias, blah, blah, blah. He's not talking about rights. He's talking about uh, um, producing a software that... Um, producing a software that doesn't defend anybody. But he doesn't care about rights. Um, uh, and so that's... So, so if I heard you right, um, if, a, if an artist takes the initiative to search your training set, they might be able to identify that a copyrighted work was used and then submit an opt-out request and you are in the process of facilitating that. Actually, no, he didn't say that. <laughs> he didn't say anything he likes. He just talked about where it scrapes the information from and what our focus is on producing a quality piece of the, the senator is putting words in his mouth that he didn't say. Use. 
Um, but to my second question, do you pay any... And then he skips to the second question. So the senator, I don't like the way the senator just addressed the question. He very clearly, Ben Brooks clearly did not answer the question, but he just, he's like, oh, so you're basically saying this, and then he moves on to the next thing. He didn't say any, he didn't mention anything about us, the artists, being able to go and, and look it up. None of the above. It's holders. Uh, as I say, Senator, we, this is two billion images, large amount of content, uh, a lot of it, you know, all kinds of content. Right? Take language models, for example, it's not, it's not just books, it's <laughs> snippets of text from all over the internet. Um, uh, as I say, to make that workable, we believe, you know, that it is important to have that diversity, to have that scale. That's how we make these models safe. It's how we make them effective. Um, uh, and so, uh, and so we collect it uh, as a... Notice his voice is starting to shake because he's deep in the bullshit at this point. So he's losing a lot of confidence. He's, he's, he's a representative for the company and he's breaking eye contact. He's looking down. He's using a lot more hand gestures now because he's scrambling for words, essentially. While he's saying, very point blank, we need access to billions of pieces of information in order to train this safely. Nobody asked about safety. People are asking about artists' rights. He's not answering it. He can't answer. Of course he can't answer it. He's, he's, he's already been caught with his hand in the cookie jar at this point. I also notice his voice kind of drops. He's not kind of sitting and speaking directly. His voice is dropping. Um, the data sets that we use, like that 5 billion image data set I mentioned, um, they respect protocols like robots.txt. So robots.txt is a digital standard that basically says, I want my uh, website to be available for ancillary purposes, such as search engine indexing. Um, and so the data set that was compiled respected that robots.txt um, uh, signal. And then on top of that, as I say, we have the, the opt-out uh, facility that we've implemented. His, his voice just, if you've ever seen Monty Python, the, the black beast of, uh, uh, and the guy writes the word, ah, uh, as he's dying, right? <laughs> um, his, his sentence died at the end of that because he's just, he's talking himself into a corner at this point. Um, he's talking something about robot.txt, whatever that means. I'm sure nobody in that room has any idea what he's talking about, save for maybe an AI programmer or somebody who works in programming. I have no idea what he's talking about. But he's, remember, he represents Stability AI, but he's talking about how they're tapping into some protocol that may or may not have copyright code, uh, copyright laws applied to it. I don't know. But he's definitely not saying that Stable AI is. Thank you, Mr. Rao. It's my understanding that Adobe is taking a, a, a distinctly different approach. Your generative AI model, Firefly, was only trained on licensed uh, data. Um, were there any downsides economically to that decision as your model... Okay, he's, he's moving on to, over to Adobe, and they're collaborating with Adobe with Adobe Firefly. Um, this is why I'm glad that, that I had a chance to do that first part, and now we're jumping into the second part over here, because I've had a chance to read through pretty much all of your comments, and a, a lot of people voiced uh, a very similar concern. And it's a concern that I have too, but I was mentioning in the last video how I feel that Adobe could, or companies like Adobe that represent large bodies of artists, that Adobe um, uh, could behave as an arbiter if they, if they uh, behave ethically because they are, they are liable, they are responsible for artists and artwork. So we as artists have more weight, more power to blacklist them, to, uh, um, to, to protest against Adobe if they did anything unethically. And a lot of people said they already have because nobody asked for permission to the artists who provided that stock footage if they could use it for training. So it appears that Adobe's already kind of effed up in this sense. So thank you for voicing that in. It was a point that I didn't think of. But now he's redirecting that to Ben Brooks. Robust or has it had any impact on its performance and how would you um, compare these two approaches in terms of um, the incorporation of opt-out and licensed. Yeah, thank you for the question. So as... Okay, so he is asking, Dana. Mark's Adobe Firefly, our generative AI tool, was um, trained on our stock photography collection, um, which are all licensed assets with the contributors. And that's actually the only data set used in the version that you can use on Adobe Firefly on the web. We we think about the quality of this, and, and when we think about the quality to your question, we had to put a lot of 
image science behind that to make sure it was up to the level we require because we didn't have the most expensive version of that data set. So we had to put more computer science behind it to make it have the higher quality we needed. What we're hearing at this particular point with Dana Rao, uh, and we're getting a clearer idea of his position in all of this, since he's partially allying himself with st Stability AI to kind of keep himself in, the, in this AI race. Uh, at this point, Dana Rao is, present, is, is positioning himself as the lesser of two evils. Um, uh, because, no, he's not scraping the internet indiscriminately and taking whatever he wants from whoever he wants. But, apparently, we, I, I need to look into this more, and we all do, I guess. Um, he did not ask permission to the licensees of, the, of their stock footage. To be able to train it, he is admitting to the fact that that they had to put more science into training Adobe Firefly because they didn't have access to all of that extra those billions of data sets, as as Ben Brooks put it. But um, little theft or big theft, you choose. <laughs> we go forward. We're looking at whether or not there are other areas where we need to supplement that data set, and for those, we refer to as. Uh, openly licensed content or places where the copyright has expired. Openly licensed to us means images that come from the rights holders who have licensed it without restriction. So very similar to what we're talking about in the licensed content. This is place. This is also what we call commercially safe. My sense, Mr. Brooks is. Okay, so he's making a distinction between just general licensing and licensing without restriction, meaning do whatever you want with it. It's yours. Basically, ha handing over rights to that to that work. So again. Let's talk about it in the comments below. Fill me in on this kind of stuff. I'm not a lawyer, uh, and a lot of you know more about the subject than I do. So, any with and if you have any important information with regards to uh, Adobe's how Adobe is acquiring this information, let me know. And if you've got a good answer to that, I'll pin it to the top so everybody can check it out, or I'll add it to the description as well. Trying to honor something like 160 million opt-out requests in training your next model. Um, Mr. Rao, Mr. Brooks, just this will be my last question, then I'll turn to Senator Tillis. Should Congress be working to ensure that creatives can opt out of having their works used to train AI models? How would you best do that? Briefly. Before he answers this, uh, the other thing too was I wasn't I was talking in the last video about how the the default setting should be to opt out and that it should be a very easy to access and very easy to understand process. If I understand right, a lot of you were commenting that the default is opt out so far. So. Again, correct me if I'm wrong on that. I had a lot of I had a lot of uh, <laughs> a lot of uh, comments to go through. To train AI models, how would you best do that? Briefly. Uh, so we have uh, this technology we refer to as content credentials in, in our, my opening remarks, and what that does it's it's a it's a metadata that goes along with any content. So if you're in Photoshop right now, you can say I want content credentials to be associated with this image. As part of that, you can choose to say I want it not to be trained on a do not train tag that gets associated with the image and it goes wherever the content goes so we do think the technology is there and available and we're talking to other companies including stability about this is an approach to honor that tag so people when they're crawling it can see the tag and choose not to train them should it. we require that uh he's basically saying it's in an image per image basis that you have to opt out per image as far as i understand here so it's not just a default setting that applies to everything. Hopefully that's something that they can do because you forget to do an image, all of a sudden it's grabbed and it's used. So I'm just, I'm very weary of this, these sneaky little backdoor methods of getting access. It should, the artist should have full control over that. And I do think that there's an opportunity for Congress to mandate the carrying of a tag like that, a credential like that, wherever the content goes. Right now it's a voluntary decision to choose to do that. Yeah, that's important. It's not just something that, that lands there, but that when you're working in, let's say, Photoshop, for instance, and I produce a painting, I apply a tag to that original version of the copy. Anytime that copy is reused, that metadata is transported throughout the rest of the internet, because once it hits the internet, bang, it's all over the place, and people will reuse it. Well, it'll attach itself to that as well, right? Because Adobe might be might play nicely, but then everybody else who gets their hands on it won't, so, you know? Fire that. There's some very interesting precedent internationally for this. Um, 
the European Union has introduced certain kinds of text and data mining exceptions, and uh, part of that is to say that you can use this for commercial, non-commercial purposes. There is an opt-out requirement, um, uh, but the opt-out has to be machine readable, as I say, as a matter of practicality when you're dealing with trillions of words of content, for example, um, or, or billions of images in this case. Um, the, uh, the machine readability is important, and that's where these tags uh, become an important part of how to implement it in practice. Okay. okay. He's fine. Yeah, it's important, he's saying, but he's already stolen, and he hasn't given back what he's stolen yet. I, we want this shit back, right? So he's saying, yeah, moving forward, sure, but I've already got 16 mansions full of stolen data there, so I want that crap back, too. Exploring this further, Senator Tills. Thank you, Chairman. I have Senator Blackburn go, and then I'll follow Senator Haram. You can clearly see too that Ben Brooks at the in the opening statement. I'm paying close attention to him, of course, because he's as far as as far as his focus and and his position is concerned. I don't consider him my personal enemy, but in terms of this argument, he is right because he's the one who's who's exploited my work and your work and everybody else's work to train his thing. So I am paying particular attention to his body language, and I'll call it out if he looks like a bullshitter. Excellent. Thank you, Senator Tillis. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for the hearing today. Yeah. It's so appropriate that we have this. I'm from Tennessee. We. I really like her blunt approach to asking questions. She kind of looks him in the face. She's that person you can't get anything past her. I wouldn't want to play chess with this woman. <laughs> She'd probably kick my ass. Thousands of artists and uh, songwriters and musicians and we have actors and actresses, we have authors and publishers, and everywhere I go, people are talking about the impact of AI to the positive or the negative. You know, you look at healthcare, you look at logistics, you look at autos, you look at entertainment, and there are pros and cons. But the one point of agreement is you gotta do something about this so that it is going to be fair and it's going to be level. Mr. Harleston, I want to come to you right off uh, the bat because um, you mentioned the NIL issue, which I think is an imperative for artists to be able to own that. And you also mentioned the right of publicity laws. And of course, those are state level laws. And uh, as you rightly said, we don't have a federally preemptive right to publicity law. And I think the dust up, a lot of people came to realize this over Drake in the weekend and a heart on the sleeve. And um, this is something that does have to be addressed. So for the record, give us about 30 seconds and then you guys see your capable team behind you. You can submit something longer in writing if you'd like on the reason state level publicity laws are not enough. Very important, very important when it comes to any major law like this, that for any younger listeners or something like that, the, I'm, I'm personally Canadian, so for me it's, it's not states, it's provinces, but uh, it's the same basic idea, the division of that property across the United States. And we're just talking about the United States at this point. We're not even talking internationally at this point, but when they implement a law, when you create a law, but it only applies to one state in the United States, then to each their own. So if if one state decides to make this legal and another one decides to not make it legal, it becomes a big a big shitstorm because you know you don't you don't want to do business with me. Fine, I'll just I'll just drive I'll just do a twenty minute drive over to over to another state and I can do business with them instead. So it becomes this real juggling act and it becomes a big deal federally. When they say federally versus statewide means it applies to the entire country. So it's one law, it applies to everybody, which is what we need at this point. In 30 seconds. Uh, <laughs> state, state level uh, right of publicity laws are uh, inconsistent from state to state. Um, uh, a federal right of publicity that's that uh, uh, really elevates uh, right of publicity to a, to an intellectual property is critically important um, to okay. protect I'm going to help you out with okay. this. a federally preemptive right to publicity law would provide more of that constitutional guarantee to her works 
that Ms. Ortiz has mentioned. Absolutely. So, all right. And, um, and we will follow up with you, Senator. Yeah. She mentions, she, she references uh, Carla Ortiz as well. You're going to notice throughout this trial um, uh, that barely anybody talks to Carla during this entire trial. Uh, however, this particular senator and several senators reference Carla very often through the thing. But I, I would have appreciated, of course, I care for Carla personally, but um, I would have liked to see her see her ask this question she, since she's the only one who actually produces art at this entire panel, which is kind of interesting, eh? a, four, a, a, a four to one contrast ratio of artist to non-artist is kind of an interesting balance in this particular type of argument since this is impacting artists. Excellent. I, I think something in writing would be very helpful there. Now, I think it was very appropriate that you had Spotify and Apple Music take down Hard on My Sleeve. Important to do. And talk about the role that the streaming platforms should play. Should they be the arbiter when it comes to dealing with this generative AI content? The streaming platforms, we acknowledge that they're in a challenging position, but certainly in some instances when there's clear, when it's clear that the content that's, that's been uh, submitted to them for, for, dis for distribution. So a knowing, knowing and willingness standard would be nice. That would be very nice, yes ma'am. Okay, I'm helping you out there. You're doing Thanks great. Thanks for being here. Okay, <laughs> Professor Zach, want to come? But she, it seemed to me she was, she was uh, it's hard to, to understand what she was asking and what he answered there. But she's basically saying, uh, should the, the record label, should the streamer itself, like Apple or Spotify or, uh, you know, or Tidal or something like that, should, be, should they be the arbiters? Meaning, should they be the referees helping to regulate these laws individually? And he's basically saying it's complicated. So I'm not sure. I didn't quite understand what was going on there, so we'll just move on. Uh, to you. Uh, this spring, the Supreme Court issued a what I thought was a very appropriate decision in Warhol versus Goldsmith, and I was very pleased to see them come down on the side of artists. Uh, I filed an amicus brief in this case arguing for strong fair use protections for creators. Now, we've been through this thing in the music industry where fair use became a fairly useful way to steal my property. By the way, for anybody who doesn't know, fair use means there are certain laws that allow certain content to be used. For instance, I am doing a commentary on, on pre-existing content that I did not produce, the recording of this Senate hearing. Could I be copy struck, struck for this? Perhaps. I don't know. So far, so good doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, there may be certain exceptions for commentary videos such as this. I, for instance, watch, you know, like uh, YouTubers like uh, Spidey who does body language or Swoop who does a lot of documentaries and stuff. They're doing commentary on other videos, albeit Swoop tends to alter the speed and the, and the style of the video itself. So maybe the, the original footage is harder to detect by the, by the system, by YouTube's algorithm. But that's what fair use refers to, that certain things can be used under certain conditions where otherwise they're not. And the artists don't want to go through that again, right, Ms. Ortiz? Okay. Um, she's basically saying, yeah, that there's fair use is a way that, that, that a lot of, a lot of uh, um, institutions would steal content from people but hide it or legally mess around with this fair use law to get away with it, essentially. And she's saying a fairly useful way to, to rip people off, right? She just asks this to Carla directly, to which Carla says... It didn't work the way it was supposed to. And... No, she answers yes. <laughs> there you go. I would like for you to talk for a moment. Should AI, unlicensed AI ingestion of copyrighted works by be considered fair use when the output of AI replaces or competes with the human generated work. Now, Ms. Ortiz has laid this out fairly well in her comments, and the Supreme Court has sided with the artist in Warhol versus Goldsmith. 
But this fair use standard comes into play every time we talk about our fabulous creative community and keeping them compensated. So the floor is yours. Uh, Senator Blackburn, commercial replacement should not be the test. The test should be exactly what the Supreme Court said in the Andy Warhol case. The question is, is, is this significantly transformative? What that means in relation to training AI models is does the output of the model bear too much resemblance to the inputs? Now that's a different question to is it competing with the inputs? Could it be used as a commercial substitute? If you look at some of the old cases on reverse engineering so I'm going to stop right there. I was mentioning in the last video that I'm very much on the fence about Matthew Seig, this, 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 this stance that he takes in this argument. And his argument is, he, he seems to be advocating uh, for AI. He likes it. He's involved in this argument. He doesn't want to see it die. It's, it's in his best interest to keep this argument going because he's, this is a subject that he's passionate about. He's a professor of this, technically. Okay. And he's saying that as far as fair use is concerned, as far as what you, what a person who's taken from other people can get away with is, um, how much does that final product, does what that AI, AI software uh, um, use, how much does that AI software's result resemble the original artist's work? So if something looks too much like my original work, something generated by AI, then that's where you know that's where that's where things might get unethical but what he's painting here what i don't like about him is that he keeps pushing everything into this very complicated gray zone he's he's arguing for you know once it's already out what should we do with it and that's where this whole fair use becomes a very 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 useless and diluted and overly complicated process of trying to prove whether or not something looked enough like mine or not. And this is where people have to take it to court. This is where artists have to spend thousands of their own dollars taking these businesses to court where they have the big expensive lawyers that they can afford to advocate for themselves and artists lose based off of what Matthew Sag is saying here. You, you, he's coming in too late into the argument. He's arguing for once it's already out, this is what we got to do about it. And what I'm saying here is no. You don't, it should not be in their hands to mess around with in the first place. We got to get them at the, at the opening of this. Before they're allowed to use this material, we have to stop them there. Not try to prove after the fact. It's too late at that point. There's, as Ben Brooks said, trillions of data sets. It's not going to happen. It's, it's, it's bullshit. I don't like what Matthew's saying here. Yeah. Companies were allowed to crack open software find the secret keys to interoperability and build new competing products that did not contain any copyrightable expression. And the court said that that was fair use. So I think on current law, the answer is no. Potential substitution in terms of a competing product is not the test. The test is, are you taking an inappropriate amount of an artist's original well, expression? Well, my time has Okay. This is, if I understand him right, because he's using very, he's using professor talk here. So there's a lot of like, ah, I have, you have to watch it six times and, and use a dictionary to figure out what he's saying sometimes. It's very legal jargony here. But he's saying as things stand, this is considered fair use. Moving forward in the future, this might be something to address. So is you, are you on my team or not? I don't know. He's kind of saying this is the way things are right now. And maybe in the future, this is where things could go as a potential, re as a newer version of this software. Whatever. He's kind of adding no substance to the argument here. He's not helping me at all. Fired. Uh, thank you for that. We just don't want it to become a fairly useful way to steal an artist's product. Senator Hurrell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Harleston. Whenever the idea of negotiating licenses is raised, people express concerns about how complex it would be and how AI platform developers could never possibly negotiate with all rights holders. But in the music context, at least, you have a lot of experience negotiating rights. Could you tell us a little bit about your industry's history 
of negotiating rights with digital music services and lessons that history could teach us for uh, whether rights negotiations would be possible with AI platforms. Thank you, Senator. Um, as, you, as you referenced, we've had a, a long history uh, with the uh, transition of our business from a physical business to a digital business um, and, and having to uh, uh, encounter uh, digital platforms that were very quickly adapted by consumers and, and had lots of our content on there. Mm -hmm. um, what we found was uh, in, ingenuity does play, a, does play a role. It's not easy, but we were able to identify or find ways to identify our copyrights, to work out licensing schemes that allowed the platforms to, to uh, be able to carry and distribute the music in, in, a, in a commercial environment that was that was positive for them, while at the same time allowing the artists to to be properly compensated, um, and this is you know with the with the in the music side we have two sets of rights, which makes it even more complicated. But we've done great work um, uh, over the years to develop systems that allow identifying not only the sound recording but also the the underlying composition. So it could be done, but what it needs it, it needs it, it, what we would need is we need help to make sure that everyone understands that there are rights that are affected and that the, the activity that is happening now is violative. And once they understand that what they're doing is violative, that brings them to the table so we can negotiate a deal. Excellent point he just made. Um, uh, he's basically saying yes. To date, when everything went from vinyl to cassettes to CDs to, to now digital formats, it was very tricky going through millions and millions of songs by millions and millions of artists and, and finding ways to protect their work digitally, how to be able to track down if somebody's copyright using copyright infringement and blah, 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 protecting artists, essentially. And he goes, it is doable. It's tough, but it's doable. But he said in the last statement he made there, it's extremely important that what's what everybody understands here is that what's already happened with, with AI is already an infringement of copyright because there no laws have been associated to what Stability AI is doing at this point yet. So he made a point of saying, in order for us to copyright, in order for us to protect artists, we already have to, we have to stop them and retroactively punish Stability AI, or at least take back what they've stolen. So I, I like that comment, it's very important. Because otherwise they're just saying moving forward, but moving forward is too late. A lot's been stolen already. I note that in your testimony you said that uh, consent is the key. So is your position that uh, every artist's work before it can be used to train AI models, that uh, the, the in company that's wanting to use that information has got to get the consent of the originator? In a very short answer, yes. And you think that we are able to do this knowing that, uh, that these platforms uh, incorporate billions and billions of information to, tr to train uh, their AI models. Understand, uh, understanding that, but it, but it absolutely could be done as, these, as the digital platforms that exist today, uh, the, the licensed platforms ingest millions and millions of songs uh, every, every, uh, every week. So it's not, it's not a problem in that respect. There's, there's metadata that we could license, we could we could absolutely do that, but there has to be an initiative on the side of the of the companies to reach out. Yeah, she's basically saying, that, "Look, the cat's already out of the bag. They've already scraped the internet for for billions and billions, trillions of pieces bits of data. Is it possible to do something about that?" He goes, "Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be hard, but <laughs> that's the whole point." It's if you, if you can go and get it, you can you can also if you have the technology to be able to go and get it. You also have the technology to be able to fix the mistakes that you've made to to repair the damage you've made already. And he said he was making reference to metadata. If you're not familiar with what met metadata is, it's basically every bit of information on the internet has tags on it, little kind of bits of information that are tagged to it that allow you to track it essentially. So if I do a painting, the metadata can track back to the origina original piece of work that I did in Photoshop or the original scanned image, whatever. So he's saying, yeah, it's doable, but they got a big mess to clean up, so they better get to it. Uh, uh, Mr. Ortiz, if I, um, Mr. Brooks, rather, sorry. Uh, my 
What I heard you say in response to the chairman's question is that for all of the data that you input into your model, you do not get the consent of the artist or originator. Is that correct, Mr. Uh, so we, we, Senator, we believe that, uh, yes, if, if that, te if that uh, image data is out on the internet and robots.txt says it can be uh, uh, subject to aggregated data collection, and if it's not subject to an opt-out request in our upcoming models, um, then certainly we will use those, those images, potentially use those images if it passes our filters. Again, he's right. He's he's hiding behind this robot.txt thing, and he's got he's got two kind of these conditions: if it's gone through robot.txt, and if it's got copyright right stuff. There are billions of images out there that have no copyright on it. Everything's digital. It's you know we post our stuff on Instagram or or you know Imager or Adobe Stock or whatever. We, you know we're, we post our stuff all over the place, all over social media. This is how we get our name out there. This is how we get our art out there. And he's saying. You know, if it's as a copyright, blah, blah. how many people go through the process of copywriting every piece of artwork that they put out digitally on the internet? He's, I don't like this asshole, <laughs> or at least he's doing his job, you know, you know, a, a, a predator is going to do what a predator does, but it doesn't mean I have to like what's coming out of his mouth. It's just, it's, it's gross business talk and I don't like it. So basically you don't pay for the, uh, for the data that you, uh, you put into your, um to train your models? But for the base, the, the, the kind of initial training or teaching of these models uh, with those billions of images, um, there is no arrangement in place. With so you, you have... He's saying initial. You see this kind of way he's... he's I'm, I'm a big body language guy, right? He's kind of staring, he's looking at the floor and then he kind of flips. Yeah, yeah, it's just the training stuff. Yeah, The training stuff is the, what we're talking, what we're here for, <laughs> right? These huge AI models are, are based off of this training. So just wiping it off and saying, yeah, yeah, that's not a big deal. It's just the foundation of a house. It's no big deal, right? Yeah, my ass. Um, Ms. Ortiz, who says that, that that is wrong. Is that correct, Ms. Ortiz? A hundred percent, Senator. So do you know if, uh, well, I think you mentioned that your work uh, has been used to... Somebody's got it. That camera guy keeps bumping the camera. It's pissed me off. Doesn't he have, doesn't he have a stabilizer on that? Models. And you have gotten not one cent for that use. I have never been asked. I have never been credited. I have never been compensated one penny. And that's for the use of almost the entirety of my work, both personal and commercial, Senator. Hmm. So if you were to allow your works to be used to train, um, you would, do you think that you would negotiate, if there was a law that required compensation, then that compensation negotiation should be left to you and the entity such as um, uh, Mr. Brooks's? Personally, I love what I do, so I wouldn't outsource it to an AI, but that's not a choice for me to make, and it's all about that. It's about being able to have that choice, and artists don't have that right now. Exactly. It's plain English, right? We never gave them permission. They haven't asked. But she's saying, you know, I pers she's saying, uh, what Carla's saying is that I, I personally would not. I, I, I'm very protective of the work that I do, as most of us are. But, you know, that choice should be given to me. If, you're, if, you, if you are giving me a deal, if you offer me a deal that's worth it, that allows me to make a living with my art, by outsourcing it, by, you know, selling it as stock footage and, get, and getting some kind of a, a royalty from that. Maybe we could talk, but so far, nothing. And they've already taken, they've already accessed all of her work, everything. It's crazy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, um, I was actually inspired by one of the opening statements, so I went in and generated a cat driving a 1960 Corvette with a surfboard in it. And uh, produced that picture. It actually gave me four options. This one I found <laughs> the most interesting. But it, it raised a question that I wanted to ask you, Mr. Brooks. How, if, if an artist looked at that and said, that is in part developed by that 60s Corvette uh, in South Beach, um, how does that artist then go about saying, I, I'm trying to get an understanding of your current opt out policy? And one of the issues that we've had here, and, and not completely related, but we have a notice and uh, take down or notice and stay down discussion in the past around creative works. 
So I was just trying to understand, and I, and I think it's going to be a lengthy answer, and then if I talk to a creative, they, uh, it's going to be a lengthy answer. But for the record, it would be very helpful to me for your specific platform to understand how that opt-out process works. Uh, I, I think I heard right that you could embed within the works certain things that already create an opt-out or, or that that work shouldn't be used. But I want to, I want to drill, drill down. We don't have time to do that now. What, what's this guy's point? You know, he shows some cute... He, he wanted to show off a cute picture of a cat and then he lost his trail of thought. I'm not sure what this guy's asking, to be honest with you. It's like, yeah, I know it's complicated, but it's going to be a long answer. So, yeah. uh, in, a, in a twist of irony, I was wondering if any of the witnesses would suggest any creative works by other governmental bodies that we should, uh, that we should steal and use as a baseline. In other words, uh, what good policy seems to be being discussed or passed and what particularly problematic at either end of the spectrum because I, I'm sympathetic to the issues at, at both ends of the spectrum on this argument. So maybe we start with you, Professor. Uh, uh, are you aware of any, uh, any Western democracy states, I'm not particularly interested in what China's doing um, because whatever they agree to, they're going to rip off anyway, but I any, any... This guy really has a hard time getting to the point, doesn't he? practices that we should look out there or bad practices or trends that we should avoid or be concerned with as we move forward? Uh, I think that the European Union's approach where uh, they have different rules for commercial and non-commercial use uh, and opt-outs have to be respected for commercial uses of the text mining in Article 4 of the DSM has something to recommend it. Uh, by the same token, I would note uh, opt-outs do not apply to researchers working at proper research institutions in the EU, nor do contractual overrides, uh, which is a position that I can't see uh, Congress adopting, but it's certainly something to look at. Uh, that's, that's really it. Anyone else, briefly, uh, could add what? Ms. Ortiz, I should also add, I've seen all your works, uh, and it, it's been since 11 o'clock last night that I was talking about Guardians of the Galaxy with my <laughs> colleagues as we were coming back from Vilnius. It was, it, was, it was a really fun project to work on, Senator, so thank you. Um, so what the artist community have suggested is that models be built starting from scratch, be a public domain only works. That's work that belongs to everyone any expansion upon that to be done via licensing. And there's a couple of reasons for this. Current opt-out measures are inefficient. For starters, machine learning models, once they are trained on data, they cannot forget. And machine lear unlearning procedures are just dead on the water right now. And this is not according to me. I'm an artist. I have no idea on this. This is according to machine learning experts in the field. Secondly, things, safety filters, like for example, prompt you know, filters, are so easily bypassed by users. So unfortunately, when companies say, hey, opt out, there's no real way to do that. But even further, what happens if someone doesn't know how to write a robot.txt? Like, how does a person who may not know the language, may not know the internet, may not even know that their work is in there, recognize that you know they need to opt out? This is why my community in particular has suggested over and over opt-in should be the key in order to base the foundations of consent, credit, and compensation. Yeah. It's nice listening to an artist talk. <laughs> She's the only one who makes sense at this bloody table. I'm sure you understand her. She's she's not using she's not using legalese in her in her speech. She's basically saying we need to start over from scratch. You need to scrap it and start over from scratch. And make a distinction between stuff that's that's open, you know, to the public and stuff that's personal. And make a distinction between this kind of stuff and put things behind licenses. But the way that things stand right now, we have to you can't unteach what it's already learned. It's there. It's it's there. We never they never they, they never produced a kill switch for this kind of thing. They just kinda let the cat out of the bag in a very irresponsible way. Um so yeah. So basically, you know, I basically agree with everything she's saying. I think it's perfect. The other thing I'll add too is somebody had mentioned. I I don't know. I don't know the details on this because I only heard it from one person in the comments on the last video. But somebody was saying that um, AI, uh, due to the fact that AI 
doesn't have a human logic to it, that the more these AI models train, the more what they the more what they output is starting to become gibberish, like how how like ChatGPT or stuff like that is already like it, it was doing extremely well, and now it's just starting to get into this kind of mess of illogical crap because it doesn't have a logical bias. It's just it's just packing it in and just churning stuff out and growing uh, out of control. So I don't know if this is going to apply to to uh, AI imagery as far as that goes, but just something I throw out there. If, you, if anybody knows more about that and how AI can uh, go too far in its learning, that it actually starts to self-destruct itself, let me know, because I find that a very interesting subject. Brooks, I, I can understand the challenges with, uh, uh, with opt-in versus opt-out in terms of, uh, of, of the task that you would have ahead of you, but w what's your view of the, the concerns that uh, creatives have expressed in this light and, uh, and the current opt-out uh, process that, that you all have in place or procedures, which I'd like to get information for, for, for the record? Uh, no, thank you, Ranking Member. Um, look, I'll say, I'll say at the start that, that we do need to think through what the future of the digital economy looks like. What do incentives look like? How do we make these technologies a win-win for everyone involved? Um, these are very early days from our perspective. We don't have all the answers. Um, but we are working to think through what that looks like. I well, will say, I'm going to stick around for a second round, so uh, uh, we'll, we'll get a little bit deeper into that. But I want to defer to my colleague from California. Thank you, Senator. His, 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 his questions are very unsubstantial, as they say. Um, not a lot of substance to it. But uh, Ben Brooks's short answer to that, what he was allowed to answer was, um, uh, you know, it's a very early phase. We don't have those safeguards in place. We're not sure, blah, blah, blah. Again, you should have thought of that before you let the cat out of the bag. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank the witnesses for your testimony and participation today. Speaking of California, I can't help but observe that uh, California is very well represented uh, on this panel. Uh, not only a point of pride for me as a senator from California, but it's frankly not a surprise since we are the creative and tech hub of the nation. Now, generative AI tools, as we've been talking about, uh, present remarkable opportunities and challenges for the creative community in our broader society. And uh, I couldn't help but uh, observe that in reviewing the testimony from each of you, I noted the common goal of seeking to leverage and develop AI tools to complement and encourage human creativity and artistry while also respecting the rights and dignity of the original creators. So it's a tall order, a delicate balancing act in many ways, but that is, it seems to be the shared objective here. So uh, I want to thank you again for participating in this hearing as we're working. I like what he's saying. Mr. Padilla is, do, is saying something. He's, he's kind of, he's, he's, he's holding people accountable to their unwilling promises, especially on the side of Ben Brooks from Stability AI. It appears to be that you, Ben, align with Carla in, in saying that artists have rights and we should respect those first. Don't you agree? <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, I can't say no, but this is for the record, right? He's a senator, so he's kind of. I like the fact that he's saying that. You said that, right? Well, it's good. I'm, I'm happy. I'm, I'm proud of you for saying that. It's, it's a very, it's a very powerful move. He just did that in a very gentle way. To determine what role we play in fostering the development of AI in a matter that is a net positive for innovation and creativity. Uh, my first question, and I'll keep it brief because it's sort of piggybacking on Senator Hirono's raised it, Senator Tillis is just uh, trying to expand upon it, and it's directed at uh, Mr. Brooks. This whole opt-in, opt-out, uh, we can talk about what the process is, whether it's easy, clear, or not uh, for artists. Um, and you, you know, I, I don't completely agree with you that we're in an early stage because it's happening fast. Tell exactly. It's not the early phase anymore. We're past that. How it's possible, explain how it works to have a system unlearn inputs that have already been taken if you get this after the fact opt out from an artist. It's happening now. While you're trying to think what it means long term, it's happening now. So how does it work? Uh, 
I love what he's saying. I love what he's contributing. His questions are, are really nipping it. It's just, we're not in the early, we're not in the early phase, as Ben said, waving his hand to the side like it's no big deal. We're not in the early phase. We're well into it. Uh, this is already having a global impact. Um, how do we backpedal? How do we retroactively, meaning going back and gathering what's already been done and bring it back and say, what about this shit? What about all this other crap? Because we have to take care of that mess before we can move forward. So I really like where Mr. Padilla is going with this. Not just process, checking a box, filling out a form, but technically. Uh, thank you, Senator. So um, just in terms of that, that collection piece, I just want to make it clear that today it is, it is very much a kind of work in process framework. You know, you can, you can go to this website, you can indicate you want to opt out. We will take those opt out requests as they come in. Okay. <laughs> Again, you have no, he's so flippantly waving off a massive undertaking. You can go on to the site, the robot that thing, and you can go through the process and we'll take this under advisement, which is very, was, he didn't say that specifically, but it's, you know, when people say we take it under advisement, we'll look at it, we'll, we'll scan it over. When? Wh wh what's your plans? How are you going to do it? He doesn't have any answers to this. He's, he's making empty promises here and he's, he's passing the buck. He's moving it out. He's moving the responsibility over to this robot dot dot txt thing or whatever right he anyways i am going to scrutinize this asshole as we were talking about before it's important that eventually there is a standardized kind of metadata that just attaches to these works as they go out into the wild um and as i say that is what the eu is requiring and i think there'll be a lot of standards development in that space again with, with you know, firms like adobe and others um, in terms of what then happens you know as i say we filter that training data for a few reasons we take out unsafe content we uh, adjust for issues like bias. Again, unsafe bias. He, comp he keep he, that. That's what he's been advised to do. You can see, because his role in this as the representative of Stability AI, he's damage control. He's the face of their PR, of their public relations, of their image. And whenever he's faced, whenever he's confronted, going, "Hey, what about Carla? What about her rights as an artist? What about her? Come on, say it." He goes. We go, we rigorously go through all of the data and we scan it for bias, for un, for safety. He never answers copyright. He always keeps pushing it to that. You can tell that's what he's been doing. That's his redirection to keep, keep the, so he can, he can use up that senator's time with a non-answer. This is basically what he's doing. It's a lie of evasion, essentially. Bias. Um, and then in addition to that, we start to incorporate, as I say, the, um, the opt-out requests. Um, Let's say, you know, uh, the, uh, the opt-out requests. The trillions and trillions and trillions of opt-out requests. I hope he has to fucking do it himself. Sometimes some of the models we release are retrained from scratch with, with new data sets. Yeah, and they take into account the, the lessons learned through previous development, both as an organization, as a company, and, and potentially technical things that we've learned as well in that process. Some of the models that are released are just fine-tuned variations of the model. Uh, and so those ones uh, may have the same kind of basic knowledge from that original training process. And there's just been some additional training to correct for certain behaviors or improve performance in specific tasks. Um, so in terms of, uh, you know, the future of this space, you know, th there is a lot of work being done on, on unlearning in general. You know, how do you, how do you interpret the relationship between training and the data in training and the performance of the model? Um, how do you potentially adjust for that in different ways? Um, but as I say, at this stage, we, we treat it as a process of uh, incorporating those opt-out requests, retraining, and then releasing a new model trained on that, that new data set. I, I... He doesn't want to let go of the data he's already got. Because that basically means he, he basically has to pull the plug on this entire thing. Because the, the stability AI has been built on a corrupt foundation. And, but, like any criminal... I'm not calling him a criminal specifically, but just this whole process is very, very unethical and potentially illegal. Um, he's he, he he stole, you know, he stole he stole the dragon's gold, and he doesn't want to give it back. He doesn't want to give it back because then that basically means it scraps his business and he has to start over from scratch. So for him to say I'm going to go through all of this former data and and revamp it and everything like that. 
he doesn't want to do that. His stability AI does not want to do that because that basically means it's the instability AI. So he's trying to skirt around this and hide behind processes and policies and metadata and passing the buck off to other people so that it becomes such a messy process that it's just not worth the trouble at that point. And there's no way, bloody way in hell at this point if he wants to do this manually <laughs> that they're ever going to be able to catch up. It's too late. It's too late. So it all, it all rests now on what law ends up getting passed in the end, right? I just want to level set a little bit, not just out of the concern for the artist, but knowing that unless you're getting one, two, three inputs a day, which may be small enough to keep your arms around. I... Listen to what he's saying. Right, I love this guy. He's he, he says, if it's a couple, it's just a couple of pieces of data, fine. You know, the opt-out request should be easy to deal with. But that's the case as we're getting into the hundreds and thousands of inputs per day to go in and relearn, unlearn, uh, and comply with any uh, consent or opt-out, uh, it gets uh, overwhelming and uh, unfeasible real quick. I like this guy. Happening now. Uh, I uh, also wanted to follow up on a subject matter that I think Senator Kuhn's touched on earlier. We know that generative AI models need to be fed large data sets to learn how to generate images based on user prompts, just like Senator Tillis did. By the way, that looked much more like Pacific Coast Highway than South Beach. <laughs> now, AI, for this is now talking to folks back home, uh, can only understand what it is taught, making it crit critical that for AI companies to train their models with data that captures the full range of the human experience. We want to be inclusive and diverse if we're going to be accurate in, in representing uh, our users, representing the diverse backgrounds of all users. Now, Mr. Rao, you've explained how Adobe's Firefly seeks to avoid copyright infringement by being trained on only licensed Adobe stock images, openly licensed content, and public domain content. So how do you reconcile both? You want to be as inclusive as possible, which means as much data input as possible, but to avoid the copyright infringement, you're being selective in those inputs. That diversity of input is important, I think, for the diversity of output. So how do you reconcile? Yeah, it's definitely a tension um, in the system, right? The more data you have, the less bias you'll see. So it's great to have more data. But when you set the expectations that we had for ourselves of trying to design a model that was going to be commercially safe, we took on the challenge of saying, can we also do that and minimize harmful bias? And the way... I want to, he, for, again, for younger listeners and stuff like that, what does commercially safe mean? Well, commercially safe kind of implies stuff that's safe to be used to sell money, to make money with, right? Stuff that can be sold, something that can be marketed online, uh, which is that brings in the conversation of artists' rights. But commercially safe is a, a more, it's, it's a more diluted ambiguous way of saying it because commercially safe has a lot of workarounds a lot of loopholes um, which is something you have to watch out for Dana Rao right because he represents Adobe he's apparently doing it in the more ethical way but be careful when people say commercially safe because that can imply we, there's a back door when it comes to commercially safe if you if you if he directly said artists rights then that's the before it hits the market which is it's slightly different, but there's different legalities associated with the term commercially safe. It allows, it gives them a little bit more wiggle room as uh, somebody who might be um, um, taking work from people in a way that they wouldn't agree with. That we have an AI ethics team. We, we, we started that four years ago. And one of the key things they did when we were developing Adobe Firefly was not only do we have the data set and we understand what that is, we also did a lot of testing on it. We have a series of prompts, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of prompts we were, we, we were testing against it to see what the distribution of the model, is there gonna be a bias? If you type in lawyer, you're only going to get men or white men and what does that mean and, 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 and how do you change that? And you can either change it by adding more data, making it more diverse, and so that means you have to go ethically source more data to, to diversify the data set 
or you can add filters on top of the data set to force a distribution of what you expect to see if you're typing in certain search terms and, and make sure the bias is removed. So you can either do it by adding more data or you can do it with, through adding filters on top of the model itself um, to ensure that you're gonna get the right result. And if you ask, if you input senator, what comes out? An amazingly handsome man and woman, just very intellectual. Men and women. <laughs> Color. Yeah, it's he's, he's basically he's kind of he's mirroring a little bit of what Ben said, you know, talking about how we need more data to make it as unbiased. So they're kind of they're using this. It's a bit of an excuse for for scraping as much data as possible, both Adobe and Stability AI. They're basically saying if you want it to be ethical, if you don't want all of your all of your but you know, if you if when you look something up or you try to generate something, and if you say lawyer and all it gives you is white middle-aged men, then that's going to offend a lot of people. So we have to be able to expose it to a lot more data so that it's not as biased because it's 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 dependent on what we input the model, or you could just do it manually. <laughs> and and control that information. You don't need access to everything. You just need access to quality and diverse information. More does not mean better. Across the spectrum. Across the spectrum. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The first time we did lawyer, though, we only had white men. And as general counsel, I was like, there should be some people who look like me as well. Thank you, Senator Padilla. Senator Klobuchar. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, I was glad to be here for all your testimony, and thank you for that. Um, I guess I'll start with you, uh, Mr. Harleston. Uh so we're going to stop there for today uh, because we're already we just hit the one hour mark. So I think that's a, that's a nice sweet spot. There's about uh, there's around twenty twenty five minutes of testimony left, uh, which we're going to do in the next video in a part three, uh, just to keep all of you sane as far as that goes. But um, yeah. Thank you for joining me again. Uh, you guys have been a huge help in the comments below, informing me, informing everybody else. Uh, a little piece, a little tip, a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, management of the comments. Everybody's been perfectly kind and, and cordial and diplomatic about it, so thank you for that. It's, there hasn't been a lot of you know hateful comments or anything like that. That said, a piece of advice for us as artists, as professionals, I'm going to share a little bit of old man experience with you since I'm, a, I'm, I'm pushing 50 in the next couple of years. Even when you're pissed off, even when you're frustrated, which we all are, it's very easy to say, screw this, screw it, we're all doomed. It's called fatalism, right? That just we're all, we're all, we're all going to die eventually anyway, so what's the point? There is very much a point. There is always tomorrow. And what I want, if there's anything that we can learn as a lesson in this, that I have learned in my own career, dealing with being fired, dealing with having my skills replaced with new technology, I've expressed a lot of these things in art talks in the past. There's always tomorrow. And one of the things that we as professionals, we as artists, we as human beings need to learn how to manage and master is frustration. This is something that, this is one of the reasons why people play chess. You learn to lose, learn to handle loss, and learn that there's always the next game. You can learn from these lessons. So what really contributes a lot, what you guys have been doing a lot in the comments, which I absolutely love, is you've been solution-oriented in most of your responses. If you're younger, if you're, if you're really frustrated and doomed, I am challenging you to take that frustration and channel that as, how can we fix this? How can I fix this? And I guarantee you, this is gonna help you to take better control of the outcome of your career and help to be a more valuable contributor to the big picture than just that, just that guy who keeps whining and complaining that the sky's falling, right? So uh, I really encourage you guys to do that in the comments. You don't have to if you feel like bitching and complaining, go about it, go for it. It's just that you won't get the attention, your comment won't get the attention that it might deserve because I'm sure that you have a lot of wonderful things to contribute to this conversation. Uh, there's going to be a part three. Share all of your comments. Um, and again, thank you for watching and I'll see you soon. Take care.